And next up, our next uh, speaker will be Christian Labetsch from BlockSize Capital. Um, his presentation will deal with uh, connecting digital assets. And currently, ah, okay, there you are, Christian. Uh, welcome. Hi. So does everything work? Can you hear and see me? And also the presentation? Everything works perfectly. All right, then um, thanks a lot for this introduction. A warm welcome also from my side. Good afternoon. Um, the next 20 minutes will be about connecting digital assets. What does that mean? Um, uh, in fact, we will answer the question how a connected interoperable capital market infrastructure for digital assets could look like, where we currently stand and what needs to happen in order to actually achieve that vision. So very briefly about us, um, Block Size Capital is an infrastructure provider for those digital assets. I'm one of the two managing directors at Block Size. We're based in Frankfurt. And what we do is we provide infrastructure to trade and issue digital assets. That basically means that through our infrastructure, financial institutions can access the opportunities that we see in the emerging market of digital assets. Currently, we are supporting over 500 trading pairs that you can trade through our infrastructure. We have connected more than 30 trading venues um, on which you can trade, execute trades, and then settle into your custody account. Um, and that means also that through that connection, we already support over 95% of existing liquidity. I think the very core of our solution is our order routing algorithm that determines actually the best trade available on the market based on fees, um, order book depths, um, and also prices. Whilst we're already supporting um, digital assets or crypto assets very well, um, I think the question is, um, what will the market look like in five years? And what is the future of digital assets, especially um, what is different with security tokens? So I want to start with a statement, and I'm convinced um, that this will happen in the next years. Um, one thing is for certain that the next generation of financial assets will be running on distributed ledger technology. I would also go so far to say that by 2030, at least five, 50 trillion USD will be issued um, in terms of securities on blockchain infrastructure. Why do I think that? Um, let's start with the definition first. When I refer, refer to a crypto asset, what is that? And what is it in comparison to a digital asset? So a crypto asset is a digital token that is inherently connected to the underlying protocol or application that's running on a distributed ledger technology. That means without that token, you won't be able to use the underlying ecosystem or platform. An example is Ethereum, but also, for example, the basic attention token for their Brave browser, um, or for example, Chainlink, the link token. These are tokens that basically are intertwined with their application or the platform. And without that, you cannot use the platform or their services. In comparison to that, you have digital assets. Digital assets are also tokens that will be issued and operated on top of the DIT system. But here we have different characteristics, different criteria. Usually, um, this asset can represent a set of right. And the fundamental difference is that instead of a token that is being independent of its issuer, a digital asset representing a financial instrument or security may be controlled by the issuer through holding the cryptographic keys and hence controlling the financial instrument. Why do I think that we will see this significant influx of assets um, being issued, traded, operated, stored on DAT. Um, I think the, the first um, point that we have to consider is the crypto asset space. Currently, we see a significant demand for Bitcoin, Ether, and other cryptocurrencies, so crypto assets. Um, why? Because we have a very interesting market environment. In Germany, we are facing negative interest rates. Um, people are afraid of inflation rates going up. Um, and you can see that amplified by 
press announcement made by Mike uh, by Michael Saylor or Elon Musk um, that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are being used as a hedge to hedge against inflation, but also diversify portfolio risk, of course. So this leads um, to an increased demand on the retail investor side, institutional side, but also corporate side for those assets. The second argument um, for cryptocurrencies and their popularity is that a new generation of investors um, with quite um, a good background and, and wealth that they have inherited um, is looking into those asset classes. They grow up with Bitcoin and Ether, and they are used to using those fully digital currencies in their day-to-day -day life. And of course, later on, um, this will, some, will be something that they demand to be included in their day-to-day -day banking operations. So this new generation of investors um, wants to actually use cryptocurrencies and have them fully integrated into their banking infrastructure. And the third point, the third point is we don't only have retail investors um, demanding access to cryptocurrencies. We also see that now financial institutions are moving into that. Why? Because they are facing margin pressure. I mean, upselling and cross-selling and um, offering services for digital assets, especially cryptocurrencies, allows them to generate um, and tap into new revenue streams. And also at the current stage with a highly fragmented, diversified market, a lot of volatility in that still the margins are quite high and this is lucrative and it helps them um, to increase margin in their operations. So this is the first key movement that we see in that market mainly driven by crypto assets. Now let's have a look at DAT in general um, and start looking into digital assets, security tokens in particular. Here we also see a lot of initiatives in the market mainly driven by existing well-established financial institutions that from a business case perspective, mainly look into using DLT for cost or savings um, uh, 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 and efficiency gains. So the advantages of using DLT and the consensus algorithms being implemented in that is first of all, that they can transfer assets 24 seven, all right? Platforms, DLT platforms can settle and validate transactions 24-7. There's no need for um, a specific party to process a transaction. This works fully digital and all at, at any time. The second aspect is reconciliation. The need for reconciliation is rapidly or significantly decreased. That means every single transaction, first of all, is immutably stored on the ledger, but also you have full consistent consistency of data. You're not operating and necessarily exchanging information between different centralized databases, which could potentially cause inconsistencies in, in data. No, in fact, you're using one common decentralized ledger um, to use the same data set and make sure that every participant in that network has access to those data. That takes away the need of reconciliation and of course includes data quality and integrity, but also efficiency when collaborating. And the last aspect is, I mean, DLT became quite popular because it's taking out intermediaries, right? At least a few, it depends on where you are at the value chain. And, um, uh, some analysis they have determined that the, that using DLT for transactions in capital markets can lower the cost by up to 65 percent which is which is a lot also it comes with the great benefit that assets can only exist digitally that means you have a fully digitized process for issuing um, and then of course managing those securities we're still at the very beginning I think this is um, the good message here. It's not too late to look, look into that topic, to just put that into perspective, okay? Um, the current market cap of all existing silver is 1.3 trillion. That's a lot. Um, but um, if you just look at other asset, asset classes, let's see where cryptocurrencies stand at the moment in terms of market capitalization um, in, in, and also in terms of relevance, right, from, from a global perspective. The, the, the current market cap of cryptocurrencies is 1.6 trillion as of today. Um, and if we compare that to the 
um, next very interesting asset class, such as gold, which is 11 trillion, it, it's only um, a fraction of the current market cap that gold has. Um, and if we go even further and look at the uh, market cap of the MSCI world, that's 40, uh, that, that's 53 trillion um, a market cap. We've not even included the FX market or other asset classes in that. So if you just look in terms of the market potential at where we stand at the current stage, I think it's fair to say that, that you could argue we're still at the very beginning and there's a lot of potential um, to grow further market cap while um, tokenizing new asset classes. Then another observation is um, what needs to happen um, and what is currently happening on the capital market um, uh, in terms of what infrastructure to use and where we stand and what the trends are. Um, one observation that, we, that we've that we made over the last couple of years is that permissioned and permissionless protocols will compete over market shares. And um, one thing is very clear. Um, there will be business cases that um, are better um, that are better um, uh, to be run on a permission protocol and there will be use cases where permissionless protocol is better. So one thing is clear, both will exist in the future. And that also, of course, uh, brings up the question, how can I exchange assets between permission and permissionless protocols? So interoperability, not only between permissionless protocols, but especially between permission and permissionless protocols will become one of the key aspects in the future. So what we see is that in high trust environments, private networks is something that is more frequently used than permissionless platforms. So the ECB, when working on a digital euro, um, and of course, with the need to fully control that digital euro, they are of course more inclined to use a private network. And you can see that there are already a lot of platforms being available and being used, such as R3, Digital Assets Holdings, Daml, and Hyperledger. Then on the other side, we have public networks that have low trust or no trust and hence apply quite some effort in order to validate transactions. Here we have very um, a popular platforms such as Ethereum, Stellar, or Polkadot. There's a huge difference between both of them and how transactions are validated in the network. And both definitely have a right um, to exist. Um, but the key question is how can we actually um, bring together both platforms and enhance connectivity on the capital market uh, side? So when we now look at private networks, what is the key aspect and the key infrastructure of that? First of all, you have, of course, a registry. That registry is not a centralized database. Usually, this is a distributed database. Just to visualize things, we've split a um, digital asset registry and a cash on ledger registry, but that is, of course, the same distributed database, or at least it can be. Network participants will be interacting with that DLT platform in this permission network through operating nodes. Those nodes can perform specific transactions and those nodes have specific rights, what they can see and what they're not allowed to see. The key aspect, however, of this network is that we have one trustworthy party sitting in it that is allowed to centrally validate transactions. So in terms of how the consensus is achieved, one party or a small group of parties is allowed to validate transactions. So it's a fully, so to say, when it comes to the consensus algorithm, centralized consensus algorithm. However, still DLT brings quite some advantages by reorganizing the value chain um, in securities transactions. And we were speaking about cutting out intermediaries and by using DLT for a capital market transaction, a security transaction, you could easily argue that a CSD operating currently a centralized system or centralized database is not needed anymore. This function is taken over by DLT as a technology. And also for um, clearing cash transaction, the CCP, when, of course, the euro or the USD is working and being operated in the same ledger, can also be eliminated right from the value chain because we can perform atomic swaps. So you see that we have 
two intermediaries being removed, but one centralized party validating transactions. Um, still, the result is that um, efficiency gains are expected from using that infrastructure. As opposed to that, we have public ledgers such as Ethereum. And on Ethereum, you can tokenize um, all types of assets. And we distinguish between fully fungible tokens, so-called ERC-20s. Um, they have no restrictions of how they can be moved around on that platform. I can send my tokens to any party even without knowing them, right? These, these tokens are um, separated from the issuer and they are not necessarily controlled by centralized party. Examples are BAT, Chainlink and Uniswap. And then we have, when we're speaking about security tokens, the ERC-1400 standard, the de facto standard for security tokens. The, they are more complex. Um, and the main difference between both is that always when it comes to tokenized securities, we have a centralized party controlling the financial instrument. So that means that in fact, um, security tokens require a centralized party, which challenges significantly interoperability and fungibility of those tokens. And this is the major challenge that, challenge that we see the market needs to overcome. I mean, of course, for a security, we have specific rights that need to be implemented into code. The issue of a security token has to perform corporate actions. And the issuer is responsible um, for managing the security. And, and, and because of those legal requirements, it is very clear that we have one centralized party controlling the smart contract, representing the legal contract. And this is the security token issuer. So when we look at the um, major features of a security token, you see that we have different elements of it. And now looking at ESC20 tokens, I can move that freely around. I can trade it on Uniswap. I can deposit it on Compound. I can do whatever I like with that security, uh, with that ESC20 utility token. The question now is, can I do the same with the security token? No, I absolutely can't. I can't freely trade my security token on Uniswap because how do I make sure as issuer that only KYC parties and parties not being on a sanction list can receive and send that token, right? So it's, it's not allowed to move that token freely around. And for that, there's a constraint contract implemented. And that constraint contract restricts how a security token can be transferred on the market by operating a whitelist. And just looking at the overall capital market infrastructure, that whitelist will become the, the central element of how different participants from the capital market can interact with each other. And we currently see that this is something which is not really developed yet. So, for example, listing your token on an, on a, on a, an exchange would require that exchange to list specific public keys on the whitelist that are allowed to trade security tokens, receive and send them. So we will see in the future um, those new roles that only provide Oracle services in order to um, make sure that the security tokens is being traded and transfers, transferred within a restricted, fully regulated environment. So I quickly want to conclude, um, and I think the key essence is that we've already made good progress on integrating crypto assets. Um, the next challenge for capital markets will be to integrate security tokens um, and making sure that they can interact with each other. Whoever is going to solve that problem first um, is going to have a major advantage in that market. And I expect security tokens to become the next trend. Um, however, infrastructure challenges need to be resolved. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Christian. I hope to meet you this year personally, but maybe next year. Or, uh, although you'll be in the panel later on, uh, don't forget to switch meeting rooms. <laughs>